following the day of Pentecost, when there was such an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and the church was born, we might describe that day as being the birthday of the church. There was a tremendous growth within the fellowship. You will recall that on that day, 3,000 were souls were added unto the church. It was nothing less on this feast day than the revival so desperately needed at the beginning of this institution which we call the church. It was an empowered church, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and growth was inevitable. But with growth there came some growing pains. Let's put ourselves back in that situation, if we can momentarily, and recognize that there were some Jewish people, converts, but saturated in the culture, the traditions of the Jewish people who stayed around Jerusalem in the environs, never left. There were some, however, who were part of the diaspora, the dispersion, who were scattered, and they lived outside that culture. They were exposed to a bigger world. Both were Jewish. But on this special feast day, one of the three great days of the Jewish people at Pentecost, there came together these people of the same genetic background, lineage, and people with uh, some of the same zeal. They were all Jews and acknowledged their brotherhood, but some had an addition to their lives that the people within the Jerusalem area who had never left did not have, and here they are together. The newcomers and the homeboys are there together for this feast. And such a day it was, as it had always been. But while they were there, some of those who were from the outside came to know in a personal way the Christ, about whom I'm sure they had heard, but one whom they had not experienced, one that they had not committed themselves to, one to whom they had not yielded themselves. They came together and they mingled in this group. The twelve were there, steeped in Hebrew tradition. These folks from the outside came in. They heard the message of Christ. Perhaps they were convicted of the Holy Spirit. They came to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and now they're a part of the church. I don't know how much space there is between chapter 5 and chapter 6, but probably some period of time has elapsed, and we open up into this mixed congregation who in many ways are the same, they're together, but they are divided. We open up into that scene and discover that because of the growing pains of the church, a problem has arisen. Everyone is together, but everyone is not in unity. There is a problem that has surfaced. It seems to be rather simple in nature and easily handled, but the, the greater problem is not what you see on the surface It's what lies beneath the surface. There is because of this rather simple problem the possibility of the group which began so well and had within it such excitement could become divided and a greater problem still is the disunity that could potentially develop within the fellowship would would create a place for the evil one to come in and divide that which God through His Son 
had brought together, and here's the problem. We all know that the Jewish people were and are benevolent to their own. At this time, the time about which we now read, it was the common practice for religious leaders to go through the community to the homes of the brethren and solicit funds for the poor. If no funds were available, they would take food. If they came to your house and you had no money, but you had hens, they would take eggs, or they wouldn't turn down a fat chicken. Or if you did not have hens but had a garden, they would take tomatoes or beans or corn or grain, whatever you had. And a few would take a watermelon if they had a chance. They would also go to businesses around the community. And they would solicit funds for the poor. So in the Jewish community, there was this benevolent mindset that we take care of our own. And there seemed to be a willing spirit on the part of the people to share what they had with others. We read in preceding chapters in the book of Acts that those who were of means, those who had, sold what they had to give to those who did not have, and they were together in taking care of each other. But the church has grown, and even this benevolent spirit of the church was administrated by the twelve. But how do you take care of 3,000 new people? And perhaps there were as many as 20,000 higher and lower priests within the Jerusalem environs at the time. We don't have the exact number, but there was a great deal of them. But many of them had not followed Jesus Christ. Some would come to follow him as we read in this text. But we have this division. Those from the outside have come in to the inside, and there is a murmuring. You know what that's like. It's not that articulate conversation that takes place in a board meeting. It's a hum beneath the surface, a murmuring, a complaining. And this is the nature of it. There were those who murmured because they felt that the, the Hellenists, those from the outside, were getting less or being neglected in the daily distribution of the food and the funds that had been collected, while they felt that the boys from home, those on the inside, were getting more attention, were getting more goods. And they murmured. In the church, a murmuring was taking place. Now, there might have been some good reasons for this. Those on the inside, they were Hebrews. They spoke the Hebrew language, which at this time they spoke Aramaic more than likely. Those on the outside had been exposed to a broader world and had learned to speak Greek. And Greek became their primary language, though they might have remembered some vocabulary from their earlier days, but they conversed on a daily manner in this language which was sweeping the country and they learned it and they spoke. So they are here together in the same congregation, bilingual, speaking two different languages and there are two possibilities, at least two possibilities which might have arisen. There might have been those on the inside who said, boys, we've always been here. We've always taken care of our own. These folks that have come in here for the feast day They were not here with us through the thick and thin. They came in later. There might have been an intentional neglect. I do not know that that's true. But that might have been a possibility. There on the other side could have been this. Those on the outside could have said to those on the inside, hey, we accepted the same Christ you accepted. We're a part of the same church that you are now a part of. We have been outside. We've been exposed to some language that you have not learned. We perhaps have been 
the recipients of an education that you have not been able to receive. And I want to know, who do you think you are snubbing us? We came from the same place. We have the same background. We're members of the same body. We have not all had the same experience, but we're in the same fight. We're in the same cause. So there could have been room here for arrogancy, and there could have been room here for prejudice in this murmuring which erupted in the first church. Murmuring is not something that is new. It is not something that is particular to this or any other current congregation. It goes back as far as this recorded history goes back, this murmuring. There's another truth. Murmuring did not stop with that one solution to that one problem. It is still something with which we must contend day after day after day. There was a language barrier involved in this first murmuring of which we have an account. But the problem was bigger than the language. The problem was bigger than the vocabulary. The problem resulted in a social barrier and disunity within the church. Snobbishness could have been a problem then. I would not want to think it, but it could be a problem now. It could have been that prejudice was the problem then. It is highly likely that that still has some credence in current church problems. So we come to this. There were Greek-speaking Jews who had a sense of superiority. They were better educated. They had seen more of the world. They were perhaps more elevated culturally. And they said to the homeboys, we don't need to be snubbed by you. And in our own day, we might state it like this. It's us against them. The problem could have, I don't know if the problem was real in terms of inequity, but it was treated as if it were a real problem. They felt, the Greek-speaking Jews felt that it was a problem. Therefore, the twelve wisely acted and treated it as if it were a problem, they did not form a committee to investigate the likelihood of a problem. If there was a murmuring, they addressed that for the sake of unity within the church. If it was food, if it was money, if it was both, there was the possibility of disunity as a result of this And where did they go for the solution of the problem? And here's the point. They went to the pew. To the multitude. It was a big church crowd. There were twelve. They weren't called apostles here. But there was the twelve. We know who they, there were the twelve. We know who they were. And they went to the church. The preacher went to the church. The twelve went to the church with this message and with this background. They went to the church and said, it is not reason, according to the King James. We might say, it is not wise. It is not in the best interest. It is not that which would most please the Lord. It is not reason that we should leave prayer and the ministry of the Word to serve tables. I wanted to develop a whole sermon on that, but I could not. Now, I wonder if the twelve thought 
that serving the tables was beneath them. I do not think they thought that. I think they saw the necessity of that. But I think they saw in their calling that theirs was a ministry that required time in prayer and time in study and they saw the needs of the congregation as being too great for them to accomplish without negating the time required in prayer and study. And they went to the congregation and said, we need help. They went to the pew. The problem was in the pew. The solution would be in the pew. And lest you misunderstand me, let me say again that the preacher can't solve your problems. No preacher can solve your problems. We are approached, and sometimes we listen well, sometimes we talk too much. But the problem, if it is in the pew, the solution is in the pew. And the twelve said to the multitude, you pick out seven. You pick them out. The authority is in the pew. The problem is in the pew. The solution is in the pew. And the, and the people who will be used as administrators to deal with the problem will be found in the pew. Oh, I think you're a step ahead of me. I believe you are. We're looking for leadership in our church. Don't expect the deacon to do your work. Do not expect the preacher to do your work. There is responsibility in the pew. And we start this series with the pew. We will get to the deacon and we will get to the preacher. But do not think for a moment that the best leadership in the Southern Baptist Convention can absolve you of your responsibility in the pew. Not a one of you. Evidently, 50 or 60 percent of our church memberships think someone else is going to carry on but we will stand before God as individuals. We won't be herded through as a flock of sheep. We'll stand eyeball to eyeball to God and give an account for what we did in the body and what we did in His church for which He sent His Son who shed His blood and bought the church. Oh, I... I don't want you to think I'm getting personal, but I think some of us have a long way to go. The twelve said to the seven, look them over. Look this congregation over. We've got something that affects the unity of the church that is beginning to boil here. Look your congregation over. There's not much in the church more important than unity. Look you over this congregation. Pick you out seven men who are of honest report. Did you see that? He did not say pick out seven men who would underwrite your budget. He did not say pick out seven men who are the most popular in the community. He did not say pick out that one who has the biggest family connection the one who is of political prowess that can get his way. He did not say pick out the most articulate one in your congregation. He said pick out that man who is of honest report. That speaks of character. That speaks of integrity. That speaks of the inner man. 
It speaks of the man who is when nobody is watching him. Look them over, church. Pick you out seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost. What's the experience that that man has had with the Lord? Does that man know about the Holy Spirit that was poured out on the day of Pentecost? Has he experienced an indwelling of the Holy Spirit? Does he know the leadership of the Holy Spirit? Is he acquainted with the third person of the Godhead? Pick out from among you seven men of good character, integrity, honest report, believed in, in the community, who knows God, the Holy Spirit, and has submitted to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Pick that man out. He may be as poor as Job's turkey, but if he is rich in the Lord, pick that man out and full of wisdom. Wisdom in this sense, I think, means more than a keen intellect. I think it means more than cleverness. I think it means more in knowing how to get your way, to weave your way in and out of the congregation and wind up getting enough to support your view. That's not wisdom. A man full of wisdom is the one who is wise for the long term. He doesn't see just the current solution to a problem, but how the solution will affect the future. I believe God has a long-distance vision. I think it began long ago before the world was created. He had a vision that reached all the way down to this good day when redemption would be provided for the lost and dying if they would have faith in him. I think the man that is chosen needs to be a man who can see down the road, not just till next Sunday morning or the next deacon's meeting or the next deacon's election or the next pastor's election, but sees down the road and believes in his heart that when the Lord Jesus comes back, he wants there to be a church which declares the name of his son in Peachtree community and will work for the longevity of the church and for the betterment of the church. Pick out men like that. That responsibility lies within the pew. It rests on your lap. And in your heart. And it pleased them. The twelve went to the multitude, the congregation. The multitude found the seven, and we will study two of the seven in a later series. They found the seven who would take care of this business and solve the problem. The seven are not called deacons. The root word, diakonos, is servant. They were called to serve the church. They were called to an action. They were called to a responsibility. At this point, they were not called to a position as such, but called to a ministry. It was an office or a position which they would use, not one which they would hold, but one which they would use to meet the congregation's need. So they did that. It pleased them. They picked out the seven. And the Scripture goes on to say, in a later verse, that they laid hands on them, which we identify that as being ordination. I do not know that that these seven were actually deacons. I know their job description 
was that to which we have referred since the third century in Christianity. We have referred to them as deacons, and I do not feel that I'm doing an injustice to the Scripture to call them deacons, even though historically we can't go all the way back to this point and say these were the first deacons, but they were the ones whose work identifies with the work of deacons. And I must conclude. It pleased the whole multitude. The church was pleased with that. The whole multitude. I think it was a unanimous vote. When we find God's solution, unless we're backslidden, as Christians, we can vote for it. We can be unanimous. I've never had a 100% vote wherever I went. I've heard preachers say they wouldn't go anywhere unless they got 100%. I'd have still been raising tomatoes at Unica if I'd been waited on 100% all the time. I never did get a 100% vote. But I believe it's possible. I believe it's possible for this church. I believe we can stand in unity if we seek God's will. I think we can stand in unity in the election of deacons and in the election of a new pastor if the ultimate in our minds and a priority in our minds is God's choice. The authority in this situation lay in the pew. But the authority behind the pew is the will of God. And we have done wrong. We have done wrongly if we do not seek God's will in these matters. Every one of us, we must seek God's will. So, the pew had the responsibility of choosing. The twelve had the responsibility of appointing those chosen by the pew to the task at hand. And they laid hands on them, but behind all of this action was the will of God. It pleased the whole multitude. In this decision, it seems that there was like-mindedness. In this decision... It seems that there was a unanimous approval, full approval, and full support. And the result of this decision was that the church continued to grow. The Word of God increased. The number of disciples, that is, the followers of Jesus, that is, the believers, increased in Jerusalem, the same city where the Lord Jesus was crucified. Some few weeks and months later, there was an uprising because of the empowering of the Holy Spirit and faith in that Christ who had died on the cross. And the church grew exponentially. And a great number of the Jewish priests became Christian. The Jewish priest. I don't want to make this too contemporary. But I wish a few Muslims could find faith in Christ. I think it would change the world. I wish a few Christians could become totally sold out to Christ. It would make a difference in the world. So church... We're now in the process of seeking leadership in the diaconate and in the pastoral position of the church. And I appeal to you today, each person in the pew, as a member of this church, you are responsible in this process. Make it a matter of prayer and devotion and the yieldedness of your self-will to the will of God. I hope from our brief consideration of this text this morning that we have seen an example set before us, preserved in the Word of God that speaks of the organization 
of the first church.